Amen. Amen. I uh, want to just say that it is a blessing to be with you today and thank God for what he's doing. I want to uh, point your attention to the gospel of Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke's gospel, the word doctor is not there. Luke was a physician and uh, Luke is wanting to share with us a word today. We've been talking about the importance of disciples making disciples. That's what Glad Tidings Church is all about. And so, therefore, that's what we're doing this year. We talked about the first thing, and that is you must get into the Word. This is not just a sideline. This is your life now. you got to get into the Word. you got to know what God is saying to you. And so that is what we want you to do. And if you've not started that yet, uh, you can do that. We have some, uh, go through the New Testament this year. Some of the guidelines are there in the Welcome Center. You can get that today, or you can go uh, online, the Bible app, uh, the Truth in the Word, and so you can get that done and start that today. It's important for you to know what Jesus said. Secondly, it's important for you to have people in your life. If you want to grow, uh, you, need a, you need a Paul in your life, someone who's going to help you and encourage you. You need a Barnabas, and that's someone to walk where? Alongside of you. And you need a Timothy in your life, someone that you can pour in and invest, with, and invest in. And so that's what God is doing. And so today I want to talk about the, well, the next way we're going to make disciples is that we believe that God has called this church to be a light to the nations and a light in our community. And we're going to do that because we believe that is the calling of God upon us. So today in Luke chapter 15 and verse 8, here's what the word says. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And then in verse 9, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin." In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And let's go to Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man came to give you your best life now. No, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek and save the lost. Father, let this word go deep into our spirit, man, today. Thank you for these wonderful people and this wonderful church. And the, Lord, the mantle you've placed upon us and the anointing that you're placing upon us. May we say yes to Matthew 28, 19. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody who loved Jesus said together... Amen, and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. I, how many of you have ever lost something? Yeah, I think you have. I, I heard about these two men. They, they were in the store. They were in Walmart or Belks, and these two men met up and. The first man said, I can't find my wife. And the second guy said, I can't find mine either. The first man said, well, describe your wife. He said, well, she's about 5'11", has long black hair, blue eyes, beautiful skin, and uh, she's a very pretty lady. And he said, uh, so tell me about your wife. He said, never mind. Let's look for yours first. <laughs> and so uh, um, I hope none of you are like that. But we, we've all lost something, whether it's keys, whether, and sometimes we've had a, a moment of panic when we were in a store and we couldn't find our children and they were off somewhere. And it's just tough. I, I was reading about how there is official government office in London near Baker Street, uh, near the uh, fictitious residence of Sherlock Holmes. And the lost items that are on the subway, the, the, uh, the buses, the cabs, all around, they're turned in there. And they said that they have at least 150 to 200,000 items that are found in, and turned in on a yearly basis. Here's a list of some of the things that they have found. Wheelchairs, false teeth, 
watches, backpacks, lunch boxes, cell phones. How many of you ever lost your cell phone? Uh, and thousands of books, bags, and clothing. Um, there, there's even uh, suitcases with uh, money in them, urns. That's interesting. Uh, human skull, and finally a lawnmower. I thought that was interesting. All of those things that have been lost. Jesus knows what it is to seek the lost. Whenever you lose something, you know that feeling you have. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And as disciples of Jesus, we want to understand the heart of God. God's heart is for lost people. Luke 15 and verse 19 talk about things that are lost. In this passage, in Luke chapter 15, the entire chapter, he talks about three things that are lost. There is a, a man who lost one of his sheep. There is a lady who lost one of her coins. And you might say, well, we lost a coin. What's the big deal about losing a coin? Well, you must understand that this was part of her dowry. It enabled her to set up house. And so losing that would cause her to fall short. She wasn't able to, to, to build the house or to set up the house after she got married. And so she was looking for that lost coin. And then finally, we have a lost son. And the son goes into a foreign country. And he is, uh, he's overtaken by his flesh and he spends all of his father's inheritance that his father gave to him and finally he comes back home. But I want you to know that Jesus told three of these parables to let you know just how important lost people are. Now we live in a day where we don't talk much about people who are lost and people who are saved. We don't, we don't like to talk about those things, but I want to tell you it really is important today because you've got to understand that people either know Jesus, have a relationship with Jesus, or they do not. And so, therefore, it's important for us to realize that the heart of God is to see people come to him. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says that he is patient towards you. Is God patient with you? God was patient with me. I, I'm telling you, I struggled for so long as a young person, and I wanted to please God, but I wanted to do my own thing, and, and finally I said yes to Jesus. Thank God he was patient with me. And 2 Peter 3, 9, that he says that he is patient with us, and the Bible says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. What a wonderful, loving God we have. And the disciples of Jesus, and we want to be disciples of Jesus, we want to be those who learn of him, and we want to, to take on his DNA. And it's interesting, that I've mentioned before, you can tell that there are certain people, and that's their mother or that's their father. Uh, I'll give you an example. I don't know if you remember the late Woody Durham, who used to be a, a person who called the Carolina games on radio. And if you ever heard Woody Durham, uh, Woody is, has a unique voice, and and his son, Wes Durham, is now uh, on the television. Now he, he calls a lot. And it sounds just, if you listen closely, it sounds like his father. And because they come from the same DNA. And I want to tell you something. If Jesus is concerned about lost souls and you love Jesus, you're going to be concerned about people that are lost just as well. And so, therefore, we've got to have the heart of God. So, Disciples must conform to the heart of Jesus. And so I want to talk about God's heart. You talk about in three ways today. Number one, I want you to understand that God's heart is for the saving of lost souls. God's heart for the saving of lost souls. Simon Sinek says that you've got to start everything with the question why. So why would be, we be concerned about the mission of taking the gospel to the earth? Why do we need to be concerned about our neighbors? Because the earth 
and man is eternally and earthly lost and needs a relationship with Jesus. And I know you don't want to hear this, but I believe that man without Christ or he rejects Christ, there is an eternity that he will or she will spend apart from God. And that place is called hell. And it's a prayer for the devil and his angels. And a lot of people think about fire and a pitchfork and, and, uh, and uh, the horn with the devil. Let me tell you what hell is. Hell is where there is no presence of God. Even those who don't know Jesus today, they wake up. And they wake up knowing that the sun is going to come up. They'll have a breakfast that day. It, you know what? The sun comes up because of the grace of God. you got food in your house because of the grace of God. You've got a place to go. you got a job because of the grace of God. Everything you have is not because of you. God gave you the strength. It's because of the grace of God. And so you got to understand today that God's grace is poured out upon man. He wants man to come to know him. But the Bible says, let me talk about the condition of man. The Bible says, it is written in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is no one righteous, not even one. Well, I'm a good good man, Pastor. I'm I'm in this club. I've joined that club. I've uh, got to hold this political office, and I do all these things, and I take care of my family. I understand that. But here's what the Bible says in in Romans 3.23. It says, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Every one of us have, and we have a sin condition. You were born in sin. Man was born in sin. There are some people who say, well, I I sin every now and then, but not a whole lot. Well, uh, I learned an evangelism explosion. If you just had, let's say you had two sins a day. You sinned a couple of times a day. Well, that's not too bad. Everybody sins a couple of times a day. Well, let me tell you what that winds up uh, in a year's time, you, you have sinned 730 times. And if you live 50 years, that's 36,500 sins. That's a lot of sinning going on, I'm telling you. But it's not just an act. Hear me. It's not just an act. It's your nature. It's your nature. And until the nature is changed, there will be no change in your life or in your future. And so in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20... The Bible says the one who sins is the one who will die. Not, well, it was my daddy's fault. It was mama's fault. I grew up in this, and he did that, and she did this. Listen, you've got to accept responsibility, accept responsibility for where you are. And God wants you to know that there will be a payment for your sin. Listen, The good news is you don't have to pay for that in the sense that Jesus already paid for it. Now, I want us to understand that Jesus wants your soul to be saved. Luke 19 and 10, he came to seek and to save those who were lost. Why do people not come to Jesus? Several reasons. Some don't realize they need to be saved. Some have never heard the gospel. That's why we've got to preach this message. Man needs to know the truth. How many know you want to hear the truth today? And so God wants us to know the truth. Some don't come to the Lord because they fear social rejection. If I give my life to Jesus, I won't have the same friends. I'll have to uh, do different things or whatever. And so therefore a person, they reject the Lord or they never really give their lives to the Lord because of fear of social rejection. And there are a lot of people who say, well, I I like what I'm doing, and I like the present situation I'm in. And so they find the world more appealing. And then the most important reason why people never come to Jesus is because they resist the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is woo and drawing people into his presence. And I want you to understand that sin is rampant in our society. And, and you know, it, it really concerns me that some people and some politicians and some people who, who think they have all the answers, scientists, philosophers, they say, we're getting better. We're learning more. We're, we have more technology. We have more science. Listen, man has learned to prolong life but has not learned to change the quality of life. And so therefore, we've got to understand that this world is under a curse. And so therefore, man is being exploited by the enemy. He'll promise 
initial pleasure, but then the problems come in. There's exploitation by the fellow man. Our, our land and our environment and all of these things have, have been a result of the curse, and man is not getting better. There are some who make promise. There are some, well, let's vote for this one. Let's, let's put money into this. Let's put money into all of these things and these social programs. Listen, you can put all the money you want into a lot of different things, and, and you can and put filters on your smokestacks, whatever. I'm telling you, the world will never change unless Jesus comes and rules and reigns. And we need to understand that the glory of the Lord not only takes care of your soul, but the glory of the Lord impacts planet Earth. There's a curse upon the ground. That's why that song we used to sing when I was growing up, no chilling winds nor poisonous breath shall reach that helpful shore. Sickness, sorrow, pain, and death are felt and feared no more. So I want you to understand that Jesus, he makes the change, but he wants to save the soul. He's interested in the saving of the soul. He, and the enemy wants to blind the eyes of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel. But we've got the message. People, are, people have been poisoned by the enemy, poisoned by society. But we've got the antidote, and it's this. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. It's Jesus that changes a life. There are testimonies all around here. I pointed out some sky. I talked about sky. Her, her mom and her dad, she came to Jesus and now the whole family's come. Somebody heard a testimony of a baptism. They're here. They're in my class and they're excited about what God is going to do in their life. God is changing. We have someone in this congregation, and they used to be in fortune-telling, but Jesus saved them and set them free today. And so I want you to understand that Jesus saves. And the good news is this. The reason I believe we're in the last days is because we're experiencing just a portion of I believe, of that great outpouring that's coming to the church. And I believe people are more concerned about their souls. They're seeing society, and some people are waking up, and it's the good news that people are coming to the Lord. So people want to be saved. Some are beginning to examine the world situation. It's time to take another look at Jesus. And so here's my first point. If you want to be like Jesus, then you've got to love people that are lost. Well, you don't know who I live with. <laughs> you don't know my neighbors. You don't know my uncle and my aunt and all them heathens out there. Well, why do you think God puts you around them? You are to be salt and light in the earth. And, if, and listen, Jesus will give you a love for people. I'm telling you, that's really the gospel. God will cause you to pray for people that have caused you problems. And God will save them and change you at the same time. Isn't that the way God works? God is so good. And he ministers to us in a powerful way. So, first of all, yes, the saving of lost souls. Second thing that we find in this parable, we find the searching for lost souls. The searching for lost souls. And this is found in chapter 15 and verse 4. Notice that the shepherd goes after the lost sheep. Sheep are not very smart. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're smart sometimes. I just... <laughs> sheep. sheep are not very smart. Animals. You, you had an animal and they can go off and... I used to have a little dog and, uh, when I lived uh, it, down, in, uh, down in the, uh, I can't remember the name of the neighborhood now. It's been so long ago. But I remember I lived down there and a lady called me. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. That's just the way it came out. <laughs> there was a lady and she called me and said, 
You, is this your little dog? It was almost three quarters of a mile. I would have never found that animal. And so I, I'm glad I did because, boy, my wife would have really, that's her child, you know, that's her, her baby dog, you know. Thank God for grace. And so I want you to understand that, that we are prone to wonder. We see something and we got to follow after that. We're prone to follow after those things. That's just our nature. But we must understand that Jesus goes after the lost. He seeks after the lost. His heart is to long for them. And so in 15.4, he goes after the lost sheep. 15.8, what does the woman do when she loses the coin? She lights a candle or a, she gets a flashlight and she sweeps. She looks under the sofa. She looks in between the cushions. So you find a whole lot of things in, in between the cushions. But she found her coin and, and she celebrated when, that, when she found it. Then there's the, the father. When they say, well, the father kind of waited there. Well, you must understand that this young man went into a far country, but yet... Notice that when the young man comes back, the Bible says that while his father was still a long way off, he was still a long way from home, the father saw him. And so that would lead us to believe that the father was looking, he was waiting. The last place where the son was seen, he goes and then he embraces him and has compassion on him. And so you've got to understand that God's heart is to search for the lost. He said that my spirit will not always strive with man. And so the shepherd is Jesus. The same intensity that this woman has in looking for that coin, that's the spirit of Christ. The father looking for the son, that is our heavenly father. Derek Prince said, I never heard it this way, he said, but a man went and bought a field and there was a treasure in the field or he found a treasure in a field and then he went and bought the field so that uh, he could obtain that treasure. He, he said, you know, that's the way God is. God so loved the world that he gave his son so that he could redeem us. And so our father searches for lost souls. And so I want you to know today that he spared no expense to claim us. If either of my sons were missing today, whatever, I would have to say, I I've got to go. I've got to find them. I don't know where they are, but I'd, be I'd believe that the Holy Spirit would help me to find them wherever they might be. And you the same as a parent. And this is the heart of God. There are people all over the world that are lost without Jesus. And until they find Jesus, their lives are going to diminish. Their lives are, are bound for hell. And so therefore, we we as the church, we're not here just to sit in a building and to look pretty and to take up offerings and to have good music. God has put us here to be a light to the nations, and that's why our name is Glad Tidings. It's good news today that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That's why I want to share with you just a little bit about a sense of urgency that I feel. For the last year or two, I have had a sense of urgency in my spirit that we must bring this gospel to the world. Many of you understand that God so wonderfully blessed us that during COVID we were able to pay off all of this building. We were able to pay off all the property, every square inch. 13 acres, all the buildings, all the stuff is paid for, and it's here for the glory of God. That's good news. But to whom much is given, much is required. There's a responsibility that God has given. Not everybody or not every person can say that, that they're able now to have another launch and minister the gospel in a powerful way. So I have a sense of urgency. Time is short and the night is coming when no man can work. And there's a gnawing in my spirit that we've got to get this gospel out. And for believers, they must grow in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're 
you're here today and you've been sitting on the fence and maybe you don't know if whether you should give your life to Jesus or you're just a, a casual believer or you come every Sunday and you've never committed everything to Jesus, I'm going to tell you the time is short. You must give your life to Jesus. Hear this pastor today. Hear me pleading with you today. I want you to be in heaven because God has come to save you and you don't need to neglect such a great salvation that God has provided for you. You don't need to neglect it. So we've got to go. We've got to reach more. You've got to learn how. And we're going to talk about this more. Do you know how to share your faith with your neighbor? Do you know salvation's plan? Are you able to verbalize that? Are you able to pray with someone if someone came to you and said, I don't know Jesus. How can I know Jesus? And a lot of people would say, well, let me find Pastor Shad. Let me find Pastor Tim. Let me, let me find this. Listen, how about you? You're a disciple. And you can do that. In fact, the greatest joy you can have in this life is when you pray with someone to accept Jesus as their Savior. I want that for everybody in this room. And so the Lord wants you to know that he can put that within you. And so we're going to learn those basic things this year. But I believe that God has called us to obey the Great Commission. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God's going to do some powerful things here. I'm thankful for what, what God has already done here and, and through this church. I'm so thankful that this Friday night is the night to shine. We're going to minister to families with special needs. We're going to do a prom for these uh, young people and maybe some of them older with special needs. We'll shine their shoes. We'll, we'll fix their hair. We're going to let them know that they are special to God. We're going to have a great banquet together. And I, this is an outreach, not just to them, but to the community. There are a lot of parents in this area and their children. There's nothing for them. But I want you to know that we believe that God loves people with special needs. We believe God loves children. We believe God loves students. That's why there's a school on this campus. We believe that God loves teenagers. That's why we send almost a hundred of them to Gatlinburg. That's why God is saying, I want to do a work in the young adults. Pastor Caleb was telling us the other day that it's growing, that he had just a few, four or five. Now sometimes he has 30, sometimes 40 in that group. And so we're thankful that God is speaking to the next generation. Don't let the enemy tell you that all is lost. We're raising up a generation that's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it is the power of God and the salvation. So we're doing things here. Pastor Shad with the, with the, with the, the needs of the sports team. Pastor Riling feeding the teams. Daily bread ministries. Ministering in our community. And, and helping those who need uh, certain things. Light bills have been paid because of Glad Tidings Church. Children have something to eat because of Glad Tidings Church. And so we're believing in reaching our community. Because God has put us here to make a difference in Moorhead City. You say, well, Moorhead City. We don't really, let me tell you something. Moorhead City needs Jesus more than ever before. People are coming to this town. People are retiring here. Families are here. And we want to make sure people know that Jesus loves them. we got to search for lost souls. Okay, Pastor, you talk about some things that we're doing here. What about the world? I'm going to just tell you, the Holy Spirit has really put it on my heart that we have got to be a church that reaches the world for Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for what has been done with Operation Christmas Child, probably with uh, all of the things that you've done and all of the things that have happened here. There are some people that work in Operation Christmas Child. They, they come, they're even working now preparing for what's going to happen in October. And, and we put several thousand boxes just from Glad Tidings Church. People buy the contents, put them in there, the postage to send it. And in those boxes, you can bring a gift where, where the gospel can't go. You can't walk in there, but yet you can take this package and inside it explains and somebody will tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so there are 2,000 homes or way even more than that that were impacted by what you did last year. We're going to continue to do that. There's probably been 80 to 
$1,000 that have gone for Operation Christmas Child. We're not going to stop that. We're going to continue that ministry until Jesus comes because it's important that children know that Jesus loves them. Archie and Gwen, I know you're here. Would you stand up? And all those people that work with you during the week, where are you? Faye, you're right there. And, and uh, right over here. Yeah. Stand up. Gene Dozier, where are you? Where are you? Right over there. Some, these people come during the week. At Peggy Hill, I don't know where Peggy is, but they spend untold hours cutting little things and making little things so that when you come for that packing party, all you got to do is pick it up and put it in a box. But these people work every week. I'm telling you, their reward is great because this is a part of searching for lost souls. And I'll tell you something else. God is calling us to reach the lost people of the world through international, uh, the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. We, we support certain missionaries, Ron Wooten in Kenya. We support other people. Uh, we had Levi Gates here who was going to, to Brazil, and we support him and his ministry. And, but I want to tell you what God has put on my heart. I believe that we must be a church. I know that a lot of people say, well, we, got we can plant churches here in America. I'm going to tell you something. That's great, but I really believe it's important that we go to the areas without, without, without a gospel witness. The Bible says that this gospel shall be preached unto all nations. That word is ethnos, which means ethnic, the people, different people groups. And then the end shall come. And so God has called us to do that. And I remember last fall when I had an opportunity to meet Dr. Ed Nelms. And he said, uh, yeah, I just really like your heart. And I, I met with him in Raleigh. And I, I just had tears in my eyes when he began to talk about people in communities and in villages who did not have a church. They don't have the, the message. Some of them have never heard the message of the gospel. So as a pastor, I think about my future, and I don't want the Lord to say to me, what did you do about the people who didn't know my name? And so I, I just felt that burning and that yearning to reach them for, for Jesus Christ. And he said, he, I just really sensed something about him. He, he actually has a part of the second largest church planting network in the world. And what they're doing is that they go into these unreached areas and they have people that map out the villages. They go through the brush. They find the people that are there and they don't have a, a there's no church. There's no, there's no message of the gospel there. They are mapping these areas out. But what he's saying is that in this 1040 window, if the people of the West and people who know Jesus, if they will adopt a certain area of the world, and begin to move into those areas with resources and finances and minister there, then we can plant a church there. He said his goal is to, is to achieve a church in every village everywhere. Everywhere. And so I just want to tell you, this has been something that's really been on my heart. And I don't want, this is the reason why. You probably heard me say this, but I'm going to say it again. In Atlanta, Georgia... A group of executives sat around a table and said this. Let's take Coca-Cola to the world. And you know what? They did it. 97% saturation in the world. So here's my question, and this is what Dr. Nelm said to me. He said, hey, pastor, if Coca-Cola, sugar water, can impact the world, I, I've been in Frankfurt, Germany. I've been in the Ukraine. I've been in Paris, France. I've been in a lot of different places. And everywhere I can find is the real thing. But I want you to know something. Coca-Cola is not the real thing. Jesus is the real thing. And I believe that if every church would say, I'm going to adopt this community this people, this village, this nation, and we reach that nation, and then we, we win them for Jesus. Put a church in every community, he says, for $400. Uh, he said, I've done away with three things. 
sanctuaries, salaries, and seminaries. And we minister to the indigenous people. That means the people that are there. No one can reach another person like a person who is like them. And so, therefore, we want to minister in these areas. So, i got a map I want to show you. If you can put that on the screen, J.D., if you're up there. This is a, a, a something about the nation of Africa. I know you can't see it, and I wish I had my pointer. But if you look right over there where Nigeria is, right in that little cove there, if you look about two nations over, there's this little sliver of a nation, and that is the nation of Togo. I'm going to tell you why I feel like God has called us to that nation. Do you know that voodoo has its roots in Togo? But yet, Glad Tidings Church, we're going to join and we're going to have resources and we're going to minister there so that that area can know the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another reason that we need to go there, slave trade actually started in some of these areas on the coast and we need to go there with the, the message of Jesus Christ. Another thing is especially impacts this area about fall, September, October we know we get worry, weary about what's going to come off the coast of Africa. Wouldn't it be nice if we put Jesus there and and you say, well, well, that doesn't mean anything. Listen, we need to go to these areas because there's not only a foul wind that comes off of these coasts, but they need a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit in that area. How many of you believe that today? So what are we going to do, Pastor? Well, I'm going to meet with my council. We're going to have an interesting meeting in a few weeks, and I'm just going to ask the Lord, Lord, how many churches do you want us to plant? How many, what do you want us to do, Lord? How many people can we win for you? I think it's important. Another thing that we need to realize is this, that in the year 2033, anybody know what happens in that year? 2033. Anybody? It is the anniversary of the resurrection of Jesus for 2,000 years. It is the anniversary of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit being poured out up in the upper room and the gospel going to the ends of the earth. I don't know about you, but a lot of mission organizations and a lot of churches have come together and they have said for the 2000th anniversary of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we want to present to him millions of souls who don't know the message of the gospel and we want to give and lay at his feet people who have come to Jesus Christ. We must win the world for Jesus. We got to do it. That's why number three, the heart of God, and I'm going to close. Some of you, they're cooking your chicken. The heart of God is the celebration of lost souls. Yes, the saving of the souls, the seeking of souls, but the celebration of souls. Chapter 15, verses 5 through 7, what happened when they found the sheep? He rejoiced and he called his neighbors. When 15, 6, he calls the neighbors, come rejoice with me because I found my sheep. What was lost, what was now, it is now found. The lady who found the coin said, come rejoice with me because what was lost is now found. The son, he came back. They killed the fatted calf. They had a celebration. I want to tell you something. If you want heaven to be excited, you want heaven to rejoice, you want the church to rejoice, you want the people of God to rejoice, you begin to preach the gospel and watch lives change. I'm telling you, this generation is seeking for a sign. They want a sign. If Jesus were real, well then, then show me. Is there archaeological evidence? Well, I understand that, and there are a lot of people who want to know that. But I want to tell you, the sign for our times is the fact that Jesus said an adulterous and an evil generation, they want a sign. But the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. Jonah went to the people of Nineveh. Jesus came to the people of earth. Jonah went reluctantly. Jesus came. He said, Behold, I come to do thy will, O God. And Jesus, when Jonah came, one, that one city was spared. But Jesus said, I have come that whosoever will may receive eternal life from me. I'm telling you, and Jonah was in the heart of the whale for three days. Jesus was in the heart of the earth for three days. Friday, he, he's still there. Saturday, he's still there. But Sunday, 
Sunday morning, I'm here to tell you that Jesus rose again from the dead. I'm telling you, you can go and you can find Muhammad's birthplace. You can go and find those who died. You can go and find Mal Setung's birthplace. They laid linen in a place. They laid Brezhnev in a place where he could be. They filled him full of formaldehyde, and they tried to preserve him for years, but they couldn't do it. I want to tell you, the world's leaders are all gone. They're dead and gone. But my Jesus conquered death hell and the grave and he's alive today and he gives life changing power to those who will serve him we got to take this gospel this is a sign for our times but we need the sun for all time so if you want to know what the greatest sign is it's the fact that Jesus overcame death, hell, and the grave. I don't know what it is, but the older I get, the more I think that is a powerful, powerful miracle. People, people die. That's a hard thing. Some of your friends, you've had to bury them. But there are people who need to be concerned about the eternal destiny. And so I, this is just a question. A lot of people ask you questions. What are you going to do for your retirement? And a lot of people get upset and they say, well, i got to do something for retirement. Would that people put as much effort into getting ready for the coming of Jesus as they do getting ready for their retirement? Point on the man wants to die, but after that, the judgment. But the good news is this. Jesus took my judgment. Jesus took my sin. Jesus took my beating. Jesus took my rejection. Jesus took my pain. Jesus took my hurt. But I want you to know that the pain couldn't keep him in the grave. The pain, the rejection couldn't keep him in the grave. The hurt couldn't keep him in the grave. The, the beating couldn't keep him in the grave. I'm glad that he arose and he arose victoriously and he is alive forevermore and one day he will reign and the glory of the earth, wor, glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I'm telling you, my Jesus is real. Don't remember, don't, don't always think Think about what they say on Fox and History Channel and CNN and SIN or whatever it is. You got to know that what the Bible says is true. This is the book. This will change us. It'll change society. It'll change the world. I am sold out to Jesus and I'm ready for the great last day outpouring of his spirit and people coming to know the Lord. How many of you believe that today? Hallelujah. Yes. Stand with me if you can do that. There may be someone in this room, and I don't know if, if there is or not, but yet i got to ask this question. We've been asking it every Sunday. Today will your last day on earth. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Do you know him? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? You say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with God. I love God, but I'm, I'm just, I'm toying. I'm in between two opinions. But the question is, how long will you batter back and forth between two opinions? Give your life to Jesus. You want peace in your life? Jesus will give it to you. Anybody in this room, you'd say, I'm really not where I need to be. I know Jesus exists, but I've never really fully committed, or I did a while back, and I've grown cold and indifferent. Then this morning, I want to say, i got to get it right, and I want to do it today, and I want to give Jesus my everything. If that's you, don't be ashamed. I want you to just lift your hand. Today, i got to give it to Jesus. i got to give it to the Lord. Anybody in this room, anybody in this room, i got to give it to Jesus. Several have lifted their hand right down here. Anybody else? There's one right back there. Anybody else? I got to give it to Jesus. Anybody in this room? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? 
I need to get my life right with God. Right with God. Anybody else? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you lifted your hand, here's what I want you to do. Step out and come right down here. We're going to pray. Don't be ashamed. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And so here's what we're going to do. I just want you to look at me just for a moment. Jesus came for you, loves you. And today he says, if you will come unto me, I will change your life. If you confess I need you, Jesus, I accept what you did on the cross. And today I'm saying yes to the Lord. If you're believing that and you really want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, Will you do that today? Are you doing that today? Are you doing that? Man, the Spirit of God's all over you, buddy. Father, touch him. Yes. Tears of joy are coming down his cheeks right now. Thank you, God. Are you saying yes to Jesus today? Amen. Are you saying yes to the Lord? Amen. You're saying yes. Amen. You're saying yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Father, I want to thank you that... Lord, there's about seven or eight people who have said yes to you this morning. And there's probably others who need you, Lord. And right where you're standing, Jesus can touch you right where you are. He can touch you right where you are. And he can change your life. He can change your life. I want us all just to say yes to Jesus. Say yes. yes. Hallelujah. Give him praise because he's good. Yes. I just want to say this. If you've given your life to Jesus, the next thing you need to do is to make sure that you, you say, Jesus, I want to make a public profession of my faith. You need to be baptized in water. You need, a, you need a Bible. You need to get in the essentials class, which starts this Wednesday night. We want to help you so you can grow in Jesus. I don't want you to not know everything that God has done for you. He's done some good things. Amen. Amen. God, man, God's got something for you, dude. He's got something for you. Hey, hallelujah. He does. Hallelujah. And for you as well. So here's what we're going to do today. I want us to close. I know it's 1132, but I'd rather, I'm thankful today. Some of you say, well, y'all got out late today. Well, just tell them about eight people came to Jesus this morning. Just let them know that that's what happened. you got to ask yourself two questions today. One, God, what can I do to win my neighbor to Jesus? What can I do? Go mow the grass. Rake their leaves. Make them something. Go wash their windows. Do something. Show them the love of Jesus. Well, they don't want me in their yard. Well, then get to the edge of your property and pray, God... Let them be open to the gospel. Gospel will break it down. Secondly, what can I do for the world? How, God, how you want to use me? And we'll talk more about Togo and how God wants to minister there. All right, we're going to sing a song, the one we open with, and then we'll close with this. Amen? All right, we're going to ask the Lord to lead a song. He's got great things for us. T, lead us. Let's go.